so as Jerry said, my name is Gabriel, and I currently work in the Condensed Matter Physics of Energy Materials program in the Division of X-ray Photon Science at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Uppsala University. Uh, the title of my talk today is Optoelectronic Functionality of the ASEC Cation in Prototypical Lead Halide Perovskites. So this is a combined experimental and computational study. This is a brief outline of uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. First, I will present a few slides on the research directions in, in, the, in the division I currently work in uh, and the directions that I've started and am now leading. Uh, the second, uh, then I will move on to present the first subtop, uh, which is a study of the occupied and unoccupied states of three archetypal lead bromide perovskites. Uh, so I'll, I'll basically proceed in this order. This is the larger of the two subtops. So I will pause in the middle for some Q&A before continuing, uh, and then also uh, pause after the first subtop before moving on to the second one. The work I will be presenting today builds on a foundation that a lot of people have laid before me. Um, and part of that foundation was laid at Uppsala University um, by the Siegmund father and son in combination who were recognized for their contributions with Nobel prizes. So in this work, I really benefit from both the use of X-ray spectroscopy uh, and electron spectroscopy. Uh, in the division of uh, X-ray photon science, um, the spirit of methodology development continues uh, with five main directions. Uh, one is to perform time resolve studies with equipment such as uh, the in-house beamline Helios, which, which is a high harmonic generation setup for performing femtosecond photoelectron spectroscopy and TMOC. A second direction is to achieve higher resolution for RICS, for example, uh, at the Veritas beamline at max four. A third direction involves uh, designing and implementing more efficient detection. So this is where I really benefited from the use of the RTOS spectrometer, which offers a higher transmission efficiency than a typical hemispherical analyzer. The fourth direction is uh, sample environment uh, development. And this is taking place at the species and hippie beamline at max four. And finally, uh, detectors for XFEL experiments uh, at the end station SQS at the European XFEL. But today, uh, I'll talk more about the materials related question uh, because my work is currently more focused on the application of novel instrumentation uh, to the materials challenges. The division of X-ray photon science to develop is uh, divided into two main research for us. Uh, one is chemical and biomolecular physics, which I won't talk about today. The second one is energy materials research. In the last half of the last decade, uh, one of my bosses, Hoffman Renzmo, uh, has done a lot of work with perovskites. Um, all of this work was done on film films. Uh, so there's um, uh, a lot of it is looking at sort of chemical effects. So for example, uh, chemical effects of additives, uh, looking at defects, stoichiometry, and so on. Uh, I've joined the program in April, 2018. And as, as Jerry mentioned, I spent uh, close to a year uh, in the Eli perovskite solar cell startup. Uh, which was a lot of fun, but I realized I really had a knack for basic research. Uh, so I returned to academic research with really some fundamental questions I wanted to answer. Uh, so since then, I've sort of helped transition the program from more sort of chemistry to uh, approach to more physics approach. Uh, and that's really been facilitated by a collaboration I've built with a friend and former colleague who produces really nice, uh, high quality single uh, crystals of halide perovskites as shown in the lower right. I've also done a bit of methodology development myself by developing a technique to cleave crystals in UHV uh, to be able to measure on really clean surfaces. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about halide perovskites. On the left-hand side here, this is the uh, well-known NREL chart, uh, which charts the certified champion solar cell efficiencies uh, for various technologies. So halide perovskites shown in yellow and also in, in, uh, in blue are relatively newcomers, uh, but it's the rise that's really attracted a lot of attention here. So now single junction perovskite cells are competitive with top uh, efficiency silicon and gallium arsenide cells. Uh, 
uh, with the silicon perovskite tandem approaching the shock peak fire zone limit at roughly 30, 30 or so percent. Uh, so it's really the solar cell applications that sort of drove a resurgence of interest. Uh, and at the moment, there's roughly 60 companies that are known around the world uh, dedicated to either providing materials or equipment or developing applications of perovskites. However, the, there's a history of basic research that goes back to at least the late 1970s, as shown here. And there are still fundamental questions that remain. So that's what makes it so exciting. So the scientific question I set off to answer was, does the size and type of the A-site cation actually matter? Uh, before talking about the A-site, let's, let's talk about the structure of the perovskite. So on the left-hand side here, this is a, a, a crystal structure of a generic cubic uh, unit cell uh, ABX3 perovskite. In our case, the red balls are halide anions, so either iodide or bromide. The gray balls are lead cations, and the blue balls are azide cations. Uh, so in, this, in the following slides, what I've looked at are a combination of three uh, azide cations. So there's cesium, an inorganic cation, and there's two organic cations. Others have reported nano indentation experiments uh, shown in the plot over here. And so from a bulk modulus standpoint, uh, methylmonium lead bromide and cesium lead bromide pretty much, uh, they show the same bulk modulus. And so this suggests that the a cation does not interact strongly with the lead bromide cell lattice and suggests that a cations likely do not have an optoelectronic function. So at the moment, the answer to the question above seems to be no. Others have looked at it with a variety of techniques. Um, so for example, Selena's group has used direct and inverse photoemission to examine the electron affinity, which is the conduction band edge to vacuum level energy offset, and the, ionize, uh, and the ionization energy, which is the valence band edge to vacuum level offset. Um, and so what they found is that the type of ASIC cannon doesn't really change the band gap or the magnitude of band gap very much. Uh, but there, however, there seems to be a trend in the electron affinity and ionization energy. So these parameters are quite important for uh, device interfaces, for example. So for example, when you want to combine a carioselective contact with the absorber. Um, Kaha and Nall have, have uh, investigated the role of the ASIC cation in solar cells. So here are JV curves or light JV curves for cesium lead bromide and methylmonium lead bromide. Uh, and so the parameters more or less look the same. You know, there's some small differences in open circuit voltage, but that may be attributed to the slightly different energy levels over here. But for the most part, they're it doesn't seem like methylmonium plays any special role. It's even detrimental because these are uh, solar cell parameters such as fill factor as a function of time uh, exposed to air. And the cesium tends to do better than methylmonium. There are, however, some reports that seem to suggest that the ASIC can actually does play a role. So over here, this is, uh, this is work by XYZ. Uh, where they have looked at the decay of hot fluorescence. So this is methylmonium lead bromide with the organic cation. This is formidine lead bromide, which also shows the decay of hot fluorescence and cesium lead bromide does not. So that suggests that maybe it's the size and or the type of a cation that actually um, has an impact on optoelectronic functionality. Maybe not for uh, functionality involving banner states like solar cells, but states involving, uh, you know, states are further away from the bandages. There's another mystery as well. So in the lower left here, uh, the materials which have a nominal band gap, 2.3 EV, they were excited with 2.3 EV, which shows this uh, decay constant, and 2.6, and now there's two regimes of decay. So that suggests that there could be at least two distributions of states with very different carrier scattering rates. So the plot thickens. In principle, the comparison between uh, a combination of uh, ultraviolet photoemission uh, spectra looking at the occupied states and inverse photoemission spectra looking at the unoccupied states compared to ground state density of states calculations should reveal the contributions of the ASAC cation. 
So in, in, in on this plot over here, the methylmonium states don't seem to be anywhere close to the band edges. Uh, in fact, the methylmonium states, uh, they, they appear above the ionization threshold. So that suggests that the acyclin doesn't play a role. And it's a similar story for cesium like bromide, where the cesium states are above the vacuum level. So this seems like a really interesting problem to disentangle with element selective and site specific core level spectroscopies, uh, which I will tell you about in the coming slides. Um, so the approach I've taken is to apply an array of core level spectroscopies. So core level spectroscopy is not just the study of core level full electron spectra. Uh, here, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it can be used for studying valence and conduction band states with elements uh, selectivity, which I've exploited in subtalk one, and site specificity, uh, which I've exploited in subtalk two. Uh, the field as a whole has benefited uh, tremendously from the development of X-ray sources, particularly in the 1970s of second generation uh, synchrotron sources. So here's a simplified schematic of a storage ring uh, minus the linear accelerator. Uh, and this is a simplified schematic of a beamline where there's a, an insertion device that generates magneto uh, The monochromator throws away some wavelengths and directs the rest to some focusing optics, which are then, uh, which then focus the beam on the sample. And the detection is uh, usually either electrons or photons are detected. So over here in the lower right, this is an energy level diagram for a solar cell. But what I've done is I've taken the solar cell apart to emphasize that I'm really looking at just this part, which is to study the properties of the absorber itself. Uh, and so these crystals are exactly what I use. Uh, and I wanted to especially recognize uh, you know, the contribution of Dr. Pavitra Nayak, uh, who used to work in Henry Stace group at Oxford, but now uh, he, is, he runs his own group at TFR. Uh, because he, he's made these high quality crystals that really enable a lot of the work uh, to be done. So in this work, uh, I will talk about uh, the use of HACSPES, uh, so the hard X-ray version of full electron spectroscopy, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that these are the conduction band states and these are the valence band states over here, uh, normal X-ray emission spectroscopy and resonant X-ray emission spectroscopy. Uh, so here's a slide on how the resin X-ray emission spectroscopy work was done. Uh, it was done uh, with the help of Dr. Alexander Kalinko uh, at Petra P64. Uh, this beam line is optimized for resin X-ray emission, XFs and quick XFs. Uh, has the ability to focus the spot, uh, have, have at least two different spot sizes. We opted for the smaller one uh, because that would improve the energy resolution uh, for, that we would get from the spectrometer. So, at my beam time, uh, we use the energy dispersive von Hamel's type spectrometer. So you can here you can see the side of it, um, where you can see an array, uh, a column of four crystals. There's there's a few other columns over here. Uh, and so what the crystals do is that they sort of focus the emitted fluorescence uh, in the vertical direction and disperse in the horizontal direction onto a two-dimensional detector. So as a, as a hard X-ray beamline, it's, it's really nice because the sample environments are quite flexible. So in my case, I used a lincoln flow stage to flow uh, nitrogen around the halide perovskite crystals to try to mitigate air exposure. Uh, this is where we've done the HACSPES work. This is uh, the, the beamline KMC1 and the end station height at uh, BSI2. Uh, so HACSPES is, is quite helpful for many things, uh, such as varying the probing depth uh, and doing interface band mapping. Uh, here, I've exploited the ability of uh, HEXPES to sort of selectively enhance spectral contributions. Uh, so here's a, a spectrum acquired from formidine and bromide at 4 keV. Uh, and the states that you see here are mostly from the, the blue, bromine states, and the green, which is lead states. So you don't really see the contributions from carbon and nitrogen. So it really allows us to focus just on the lead and bromine states. Uh, our collaborators, uh, the group of Professor Miko Adelius at Stockholm University, they've used a nice uh, tool, toolkit here. This is uh, ab initial molecular dynamics. And so in the simulation on the right-hand side, what they've done is that they've 
uh, shrunk the lead and the iodine uh, atoms. And so they simulate. Uh, so what they do is they have a starting crystal structure. And then they, they run a simulation with the temperature set at 300 Kelvin and the pressure set at either zero or one atmosphere. Just try to simulate the experimental conditions more accurately. Uh, and so they complete the simulation. They take a, a variety of snapshots uh, and then they calculate the X-ray absorption spectra for each sort of individual atom and then generate an aggregate spectrum for comparison to experiment. Uh, so the toolkit they use is CP2K, uh, which is designed to simulate solid state, liquid, molecular, and biological systems. Now I'll start showing some, some data here. On the left-hand side, this is the bromine K-edge resonant X-ray emission spectroscopy map. On the right-hand side, this is the lead L3 edge uh, map. And these are both recorded from single crystal methylmonium lead bromide. In the map on the left-hand side, we can, we can monitor uh, three emission lines simultaneously uh, because the, the window, the spectrometer is roughly 250 EV wide. Uh, so we're looking at the bromine K beta three, K beta one, and the valence to core. Uh, so later on this work, what I'll do is I'll show you some HERFT uh, XAS, high energy resolution fluorescent detected uh, extra absorption spectra. And this is represented by the vertical line cut over here. The region of interest is shown over here in the box. Uh, so these are the near edge features. So as a two-dimensional map, they, there's more information contained here than, than just X-ray resorption spectroscopy or photoelectron spectroscopy. And typically, these maps are plotted with the excitation energy or the incident photon energy on the x-axis. Uh, but I've chosen to plot it this way to, to show a comparison between this and uh, photoelectron spectra later. I also need to add that because these materials are known to be so sensitive to a variety of beams, I've done a, a series of beam damage checks, which involved uh, basically running the spectrometer sequentially and then taking the HERF cuts and seeing when things start changing. This is a comparison between, uh, on the left-hand side, these are photoelectron survey spectra. On the right-hand side, this is a resident X-ray emission uh, map. And the, the blue arrow here, in both cases, is, is intended to represent the same energy offset, uh, which is between the valence band and the 3P, uh, bromine 3P core level. So XES and PES are, are, are quite complementary actually, because they, probe, they both probe the occupied states and they share in principle the same one core or valence hole final state, but they also have distinct advantages and disadvantages as well. So for XES, uh, the advantage here is that we can selectively look at, uh, in this case, bromine P states, um, but there's also, pretty significant core hole lifetime broadening uh, as well. With photoelectron uh, spectra, we get all of the core levels reference to the, to the Fermi energy, uh, but we don't have the element orbital selectivity, but we, we have better energy resolution uh, because we don't have that core hole lifetime, or we don't have that bromine 1S core hole lifetime broadening. So now we're gonna look a little bit more into, uh, at, the, at the differences between, uh, you know, in the near edge region uh, for various compounds of interest. So on the top row, these are all uh, lead L3 uh, regions of interest for lead bromide. And lead bromide serves as a really good counterexample to the perovskites because uh, it's not a perovskite, it's not cubic. And figures B and C, this, this is for formidino lead bromide and cesium lead bromide, the two perovskites. Uh, so first of all, we can see that uh, you know, the, the, the off-resonant features look very different. So for, for Medina Bromide, we can see these crystal field um, features, uh, which we can also kind of see in cesium Bromide, but they're not as distinct. So that's already telling us that there's sort of structural differences that we can probe. And the lower row here, these are all broken K-edge uh, regions of interest. And so for lead bromide, when we compare lead bromide figure D, to figure C and F, we immediately see that once we have the ASA cation in place, uh, the, the spectra looks very different. So we can kind of guess already that the higher energy portion of the main edge could be related to the ASA cation. 
In addition, we also noticed that the width of the main edge is, is different between formidine led bromide in uh, figure E and cesium led bromide figure F, where the width is roughly 80% uh, for cesium led bromide. So this is very promising. It shows that you know, uh, resin X-ray emission spectroscopy is very sensitive to differences in the structure uh, and also in the bonding uh, of these compounds. To facilitate a more quantitative comparison, we can take the herftex as fine cut uh, and, and compare all of the compounds together. So figure A, this is uh, the lead L3 uh, XAS spectra. Now there's two types of XAS spectra. Uh, the solid lines are for the conventional or total fluorescence yield X-ray absorption spectra. Uh, and the, the markers are for the herft XAS spectra. And we can notice immediately that for the TFY spectra, it basically looks like a Gaussian broadened step function. And that's because the coral lifetime broadening for lead L3 is rather large. And there's not a lot we can do about it, but because we have a spectrometer, we can trade the 6.1 EV for the two and a half EV. So when we compare blue, red, and black, the three perovskite compounds, we can see that they both share similar features, but the sharpness of the features are quite different. So this is, we can already qualitatively see that uh, for the case of blue, for redeeming that bromide, that uh, the lead bromide octahedra seems to be less distorted internally compared to the red one, season lead bromide. Uh, in figure B, this is a comparison between, um, again, two types of bromine KH XAS spectra. The solid lines represent the TFY and the markers represent the Herft XAS spectra. Uh, so here the, the, the gain in resolution is, or, or rather the, uh, the decrease of coral lifetime running is not as dramatic. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so for TFY is roughly two and a half EV and for Herft is 2.2. Uh, but it's still really helpful because in the case of formidine and bromide, when we look at the TFY spectrum, we, it's, it's hard to say whether it, it appears that maybe there's sort of two distributions of states. Uh, with the Herf spectra, we can really see that there, there are indeed two distributions of states. So since the XAS spectrum is a reflection of the element-specific unoccupied DOS, uh, albeit with coral relaxation effects, uh, in the coming slides, I'll show you what we can extract uh, with the help of simulation. Uh, but first, we will try to ex extract some trends uh, from the experimental spectra alone. So on the left-hand side, this is a, a comparison of the bromine K perfect XAS vector for the three perovskite compounds. Uh, I've chosen to use a sigmoid fit for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the absorption onset for black and red are pretty close together. And so the sigmoid fit actually allows us to distinguish or differentiate between the two because the uncertainty in the fit is less than the difference. Uh, the second reason is that the sigmoid fit actually allows us to do a systematic comparison of the experimental main edge width. So here we're defining the width to be 75% of the step height. Uh, so there, there appears to be a trend where it is the narrowest for season lead bromide and it increases for methyl ammonium bromide and finally for its largest for formidine lead bromide. So what I've done here in this table is I've taken ratios uh, relative to formidine lead bromide. There's also a systematic trend, it appears, because for formidine lead bromide, that has the largest cation. So, you know, the absorption onset is, is it's lower relative to the two. Methylmonium lead bromide, the one in black, has something that's sort of in between. It's slightly smaller than formidine lead bromide. And for cesium lead bromide, that's 80% of the size of formidine lead bromide. So we'll explore this trend later. Now I'm going to show you um, a comparison between the simulated spectra and the experimental spectra for the three different compounds. So the experimental spectra are all shown in markers here. And the simulated spectra, the aggregate simulated spectrum is the solid uh, line. And then the decomposition of the simulated spectrum into its components, uh, which are primarily, there are primarily two components. There's the sigma symmetry states and the pi symmetry states. So in the diagram over here, the sigma symmetry states are related to lead-bromine-lead bonding. 
and the biosymmetry states are sort of orthogonal to, to this. So they, they could be influenced by the ASA cation. Uh, one common feature for all three is that the rising uh, edge or, or sort of the, the lower photon energy uh, feature are, are all sigma symmetry states, whereas this pi symmetry states are all at higher, uh, higher energy. If we take the peak maxima and we get the energy offset, and then we take a ratio, we get something that exactly matches the uh, ratio of bromine KXAS main edge widths. So that suggests that the reason for the, the, the width of the main edge originates from the energy separation between, between these, these two distribution of states. And because the XAS spectrum is a reflection of the conduction band, uh, this suggests that the conduction band width in general is determined by the sigma pi symmetry, uh, sorry, sigma pi energy separation. To understand the origin of this trend, uh, I've looked more at the crystal structure. So the Gaussian tolerance factor shown in this, uh, as this equation in the lower left, is a structural only descriptor uh, that's very old, um, but it's still widely used. And the ideality factor of the perovskite is uh, nominally one. So using standard, uh, standard values for the crystal radii, meaning from Shannon's crystal radii and from uh, some computed values for the average radius of the methylmonium and the fermilinium, uh, we get these Gaussian tolerance factors. And if we, again, take ratios of these factors, we get something that lines up pretty well uh, between the Gaussian, relative Gaussian tolerance factor, the sigma pi offset, and also the bromine KXAS main edge width. Uh, so so that's, that's a nearly linear correlation um, between a structural descriptor and a main edge width. So uh, to explore that a little bit more, we looked at our molecular dynamic simulations. This plot over here shows the lead bromine bond distribution. And it seems that between the three different compounds, there's not a lot of difference. Uh, there's some small differences, which seems to be supported by our crystal field um, measurements. Uh, but the biggest changes are actually rather uh, for the tilting of the octahedra represented as the lead bromine lead uh, bond angle. So here we see that uh, seasonal lead bromide uh, in red here with the smallest cation size has a lower bond angle relative to two. And as the ASA cation size increases, the bond angle gradually moves towards 180 degrees. So this suggests that the conduction band width is directly governed by the amount of tilting of the lead bromine octahedra in the perovskite structure. So before moving on to the presentation of the, uh, or the investigation of the occupied states. I just wanted to take a pause here and ask if there are any questions to be answered. There's a few and people may be typing in more right now. Um, first, uh, uh, just kind of a, a broad question. Uh, part of your motivation was of course to discuss the perovskite solar cells. Um, if the A site uh, indeed is strongly involved in electronic structure and whatnot, does that in any way feed back to possible new directions for uh, improved photovoltaics? I, I think it does because in devices that are being commercialized, uh, what, what people have done is they've, they, they, they typically use the combination of both ASA cations and also excite anions as well for different purposes. Uh, so state-of-the-art solar cells tend to use more or, of the organic cations, uh, but they're not really great for commercialization because they're a little sensitive to ambient stability. So maybe people mix in a little bit of cesium uh, and maybe the cesium sort of just coats the interface between the perovskite and the periselective layer. Uh, so, so first of all, it gives uh, people further insight into how to design, for example, their interfaces. Uh, but secondly, it, it really reveals the, the, the role of the ASAC can. So when, when chemists go and synthesize new perovskite type compounds, they can better understand that uh, 
the modifications to the electronic structure are not just necessarily in the occupied states. They happen in the unoccupied states. So actually in the coming slides, I'll show you that the occupied states are not very much affected actually by the, by the ASA canon, which may have led some people to think that they're relatively inert. Okay, uh, Eric, you have a question? Yeah, um, in sulfur compounds, including sulfur and molly disulfide and some others, you can have a second band gap within the unoccupied states above a first group of bands. I'm wondering, your spectra have states that seem awfully split off from the ones higher up. Do you think there's any evidence of a second band gap that maybe is not resolved because the, the core edges are, are quite broad, even with Hurfty? Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, I, sus I suspect not because the simulated spectra here, like I, I've seen the unbroadened versions of the simulated, uh, the sigma and pi temperature states, and they don't seem to suggest that there is a second bank gap. Okay. Okay, uh, Matt, you have a question? Oh, yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, I hope you can hear me okay. I, I'm not the B1. Um, I was, I was a little confused in your last two slides, which seemed really interesting, um, but whether the R values were bond distances or ionic radii. And then I was confused about why those values should be the same as the sigma pi offset, which is, if I understand right, like an energy value. Could, could, maybe I missed something. Can you clarify that? Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's a great question. So the R values are, are just the crystal radii um, parameters, uh, but the fact that this when you say nearly, so when you say sorry when you say crystal radii, do you mean like the ionic size or the distance between the atoms in the crystal? It's the ionic size. Okay. Yeah. So so for okay. example, the the lead and bromine values are taken from a rather old database now. It's Shannon's crystal radii. Um, okay, so, so then the bond lengths are probably not so important, but the angles might be different because the ionic radii are smaller, or significantly smaller than the bond distances. Is that? Yeah, I, I think for cesium and bromide, the, the ionic radius of cesium is quite a bit smaller than what it's supposed to be for an ideal perovskite compound. And so that probably affects. I guess the, the lead bromide of the future have to sort of tilt to try to accommodate the smaller A's I get on. Right, okay, okay. Um, okay. I mean, I have some speculations about why the this st structure only descriptor has shows this linear correlation with the electronic structure, but, but they're just hypotheses at the moment. Okay, so yeah, so great. Thanks, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Selena, you have a question? Yeah, uh, thank you. It goes in the same topic. So very interesting about this octahedral tilting that you see this correlation. I'm just wondering if you could prove this by measuring at different temperature. So by going from orthorhombic to cubic for the cesium lead bromide. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely a good way to check as well. Um, so it's, it's possible in, in your setup to do this? Uh, yeah, so so at P64, it's, it's possible to to heat and, and cool the crystals. Uh, so, so yeah, I think, I think it's quite, the experiment's quite accessible. Uh, I mean, the other way to check this correlation is to try to use a larger uh, range of ASEC cation sizes, ideally both organic or inorganic, but, but then that these three cations are the archetypal ones. So I think the temperature dependent experiment is probably more, um, it's more straightforward. All right, thank you everyone for the questions and Gabriel, you should continue. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna shift gears and look at the occupied states. Uh, so we're looking at the normal X-ray emission spectra for the three perovskite compounds here. And there are, there are two features, there are two regions of interest. So one is the K beta one transition energy and the second one is the uh, valence decor. If we look at, we start with the K beta one, that there appears to be, again, a systematic trend. And also there, there are differences actually uh, between the three compounds, which is initially surprising to me because as somebody who just, who started off doing electron spectroscopy, I thought all core level offsets were fixed. 
Uh, so this suggests that the valence electron density is actually different between the three compounds. Uh, and it suggests that the formidine lead bromide in blue has the most ionic lead bromine bond relative to the other two. So to check this uh, deduction, we can look at the relative intensities of the valence to core feature uh, with the K-beta-1 features, uh, with the core to core lines all normalized. Uh, here we see that uh, the, the, blue, uh, the blue trait shows a little bit more intensity. So, 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 so that seems to be consistent with this um, deduction that there's, there, there's a more ionic lead bromine bond for formidine lead bromide. This quarter core transition energy trend seems to uh, hold for the valence to core as well. Uh, here I fitted the, uh, the bromine 4P distributions, uh, which are asymmetric from our, we know that from our ground state density of states, but, but their purpose was just to extract the peak maxima value over here and also to see how well it fits on the higher energy side. Uh, so something interesting is that despite the structural differences, the bromine 4P distributions are rather similar for the three different compounds. Uh, so that raises the question of what's actually different in the occupied states. So here we turn to Hexpas. Uh, Left-hand side here, this is the, the black one is a Hexpas spectrum of formidine and bromide acquired at uh, 4KeV. And on the right-hand side, this is for cesium lead bromide. So at 4KeV, 4KeV, we don't expect to see the carbon and nitrogen states. Uh, so the DOS calculations for the bromine states in blue and the lead states in green look pretty similar for the two different compounds. Uh, but the main difference seems to be at near the valence band edge over here. Uh, so since our extra emission spectra told us that the bromine 4P states are pretty similar, this strongly suggests that these states are mostly, have mostly lead character. And the differences at the valence band near the valence band edge are, are pretty important actually for optical electronic func uh, functionality because the banner states often participate in optical absorption and emission. In this slide, I will bring together all of the different measurements uh, to, to try to see what sort of trends we can extract. So first we look at the unoccupied states over here. And this is the absorption onset uh, trend where we see an increasing trend as the ASA cation gets a bit smaller in the case of cesium. We see a similar trend with the, uh, with, with the study of the occupied states uh, relative to the bromine 1S core level. Uh, what's interesting is that there seems to be a correlation between our findings over here um, and electron affinity and ionization energy values reported in the literature. There seems to be this sort of step function as well. So we think there, there's a connection. Uh, it depends on the bromine 1S ionization potential, which I can only speculate a little bit about and I won't talk too much about, but uh, yeah, there seems to be a connection. Uh, the second thing uh, we found is that there's a correlation between this, this is the pi sigma energy offset. So there's a correlation between this offset in the conduction band uh, and the Gaussian tolerance factor. So this is a direct structural property relationship. And we think that this offset has something to do with the differences in how hot electrons cool. So if we, if we assume that the pi states and the sigma states have different carry scattering rates, then maybe we can put an argument together for, for how this would affect the mechanism of hot carry cooling. Uh, but, but I won't go into that uh, right now. So I'm just gonna wrap up this subtalk, the first one with some conclusions. Uh, first, Herft XAS, resin X-ray emission and normal X-ray emission are, uh, are very sensitive to structural chemical differences in three archetypal lead bromide compounds, even though they share the same lead bromide octahedra and the formal oxidation states of lead and bromine are the same. Uh, the second conclusion is that uh, the relative conduction bandwidth of the lead bromide compounds and possibly all halide perovskite compounds is linearly correlated with the relative Gaussian tolerance factor. And the third one is that the occupied states show a cation related effects mostly in the vicinity of the valence band maximum. So here I'll take a short pause before continuing on to the second subtalk.
You know, we had a uh, we had a lot of questions in the first break, and we're a little worried about time, so I'm going to suggest that people hold their questions for the end of the talk. Okay. All right. Okay. So now I'll move on to the second one. So in this work, I've now exploited the site specificity of core level spectroscopy. Uh, so this schematic shows all of the spectroscopies used in this work, actually. Uh, so conventional photoelectron spectroscopy, or shown here as valence photoemission or core level photoemission are really used to ensure that the sample that we're measuring are is really what it is what it's supposed to be because this class of material is so sensitive to beams. By studying the decay of the core excited nitrogen one s core level, we can we can say something about both the coupling in the occupied states between the organic and inorganic cell balances and the coupling in the unoccupied states. So this is one of the decay mechanisms. This is participator autoionization decay, where the core excited electron actually participates. Uh, and the final state is the same as valence photoemission, hence the, hence the name resonant photoemission. And the second, uh, so this is a local mechanism where the core excited electron has not left its host nitrogen atom yet. In the second case, this is spectator autoionization decay, where the core excited electron just sort of spectates and shifts the energy of the normal OJ-like decay uh, up perhaps by a few EV. Still a normal decay, uh, sorry, still a localized decay. In the third type of decay, uh, this is normal OJ decay, but it's, it's, it follows the resonant excitation. So that means that the core excited electron must have gone somewhere else, like delocalized into the surrounding matrix. All three mechanisms have different final states and hence different signatures. And all of them have different dependencies on the excitation energy. So for example, normal OJ does not have dependence on the excitation energy. Uh, so we can then use that fact to differentiate between all three mechanisms. The approach I've taken here is to start off with high quality single crystals of head perovskites supplied by Dr. Prabhita Nayak, uh, then cleave them in UHV, uh, then and measure on them using a low photon flux beam line, uh, which is roughly 10 to 11 photons per square centimeter per second. Uh, to compensate for the lower flux, then we have to use a higher transmission spectrometer. So here is a schematic of the RTOS spectrometer, which is just a giant flight tube, actually. Uh, and to ensure that we know what we're measuring on, then I've developed a protocol to check extensively for beam damage. So using combination of both photoelectron spectroscopy and also more surface sensitive or bulk sensitive uh, NEXAFs. This is a collection of core level spectra where the red spectra were recorded from the same spot. And then a NEXAF scan was performed that's, that took over two hours. And the blue spectra were all recorded from the same spot after the NEXAF scan was done. The typical markers of beam damage for this class of material include uh, dose-dependent loss of nitrogen 1s intensity relative, relative to lead. Uh, we, don't, we don't see that. Uh, there's, there could be an increase in metallic lead. Uh, we don't see that lower binding energy over here. Uh, there could be a growth of PK symmetry and correlated changes in the intensities and or uncorrelated shifts in the peak positions. Uh, so we, we, don't, we don't see any of that. So we, we have some confidence that the material is chemically intact um, under the beam uh, for, for hours. As an additional check, uh, we can do uh, partial electron yield, which is sort of like OJ electron yield and total electron yield next half. So the plot on the left here, this shows two uh, measurements performed simultaneously. Uh, so PEY was done using the RTOS spectrometer with a 50 EV kinetic energy cutoff, and TEY was uh, recorded by measuring the sample drain current. And they both overlap, overlap on top of each other. So, so that's a pretty good sign that the sample, both in the surface region and in the more bulk region, is basically the same. And the reason why this is important is because the OJ or OJ-like um, nitrogen KVV uh, electrons are coming out with kinetic energies of roughly 350 EV or so. So they're really coming out from the top two, three unit cells. So it's important to make sure that the surface electronic structure is comparable to the bulk electronic structure. 
So this surface uh, model was derived by doing quantitative chemical analysis with full electron spectroscopy. Uh, and it's about, the, the error is about 10% off. So we think it's a reasonably realistic model uh, for what we're measuring. So now we're gonna look at the occupied states. And on the left-hand side here, I'm showing two spectra, two decay spectra associated with two excitation energies. So the black spectrum uh, was reported at 394.5. So that's around here in the absorption spectrum. And the orange one was reported at 405.3. So it's close to the main edge over here. So once we're on resonance, we, we see a lot of nitrogen related decay. If we subtract the black spectrum from the orange one, we can then remove the photoelectron features. And this different spectrum then represents all of the electron emission arising from nitrogen 1s core hole decay only. So embedded in this spectrum is uh, are potentially all of the mechanisms, you know, uh, participator, spectator, uh, and normal J decay. So the region of interest is it's closer to the valence band over here. So now we zoom in and the, to align the, the, the DOS calculations, uh, we can at first align the IADMP projected DOS uh, because the valence band is mostly made up of it and that automatically aligns the nitrogen DOS. Our calculations show that the molecular orbitals in methylmonium, which is this molecule over here, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty MO-like. Uh, so it seems to be rather unperturbed by its environment, but there's a little bit of uh, intensity over here that overlaps the valence band. So this suggests that there's a presence of hybridized MA uh, states. Our experiments don't support that directly. All they can say is that if they're there, then the intensity is pretty low. Uh, so I guess what we can take away from this is that the coupling in the occupied states, it's, it's rather uh, weak. A different picture emerges when we look at the unoccupied states. So this is a comparison of two OJ and OJ-like uh, spectra. The red one is uh, associated with resin excitation at 403. And the 407 should, uh, should be just normal OJ. So if we take a different spectrum, we get these extra features over here uh, and, and we can assign them to, to spectator autonization and participate autonization. Uh, but the key thing here is that there's actually a rather large component of normal J decay. So what that's telling us is that a lot of these core excited electrons have actually gone somewhere. And we think it's gone into the lead halide sublattice because our DOS calculations show that the molecular orbitals for methylmonium are pretty delocalized, meaning that the carbon states and the nitrogen states pretty much overlap on top of each other. Uh, so, so either way, the normal JDK shows that either we're exciting a hybridized uh, ma led iodide state, or there's actually charge transfer where the core excited electron is initially bound to the nitrogen, but then it goes away within the lifetime of the uh, nitrogen one score hole which is rough on the order of femtosecond. Uh, so this finding shows that the unoccupied states are strongly coupled and, and suggests that the sort of the picture of an electronically inert ASA cation is, uh, is not quite correct. So I'm just gonna wrap up this with a few conclusions. Uh, first, it is possible to perform extended measurements on uh, halide perovskite surfaces, um, but then one needs to take a few precautions. Uh, the second is that we, our computer nitrogen projected DOS shows weak electronic coupling in the occupied states. Uh, and the third one is that through, resident, through the use of resin OJ electron spectroscopy, we can show that there's electron coupling, uh, electronic coupling in the unoccupied states. Uh, so finally, I'd like to wrap up with some acknowledgements. Uh, particularly like to acknowledge three people. Uh, one is Dr. Babichu Nayak. It's, uh, it's a great partnership. And, the high quality crystals have really enabled a lot of this work. I'd also like to thank my two advisors who are very complimentary. The, uh, this Professor Sergei Butorin and Professor Hokan Renzmo uh, at Uppsala University. I'd also like to thank the, my co-workers, uh, Dr. Konstantin Simonov, Sebastian Svanstrom, David Fuyo, Son Mukherjee, Friedrich Johansson, Andreas Lindblad. Uh, and special thanks go to Professor Miko Delius and this group for the computational work. 
Uh, and there's a lot of other people to thank. So I just thank Desi, Helmholtz, our advisor, and uh, funding agency. So with that, I thank you for your time. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, while people are typing in questions, um, I'll ask one to begin, uh, which kind of has two parts. Uh, the first is, did you consider measuring the uh, the bromine XAS at lower at lower energy edges? Yes. It's just that that um, the spectrometer was well set up for that for for the KH because you wanted to look at that. So it was more a matter of convenience, actually. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was actually discussing this with uh, Dr. Alexander Kalinko, uh, who's a BMI scientist, and we realized that it is possible to get a smaller coral lifetime broadening with, uh, you know, with with the with the M1 edge, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was wondering. I mean, the L edge would be would also help with the core hole, I suspect, but of course, it's at an inconvenient energy. Um, uh, and the, the, the other thing I was wondering about is although, although beam damage would no doubt be a problem, is these lower ener the low energy M edges, um, the Raman, uh, X-ray Raman could be interesting, um, would let you get a more complete picture of the LDOS. And uh, so higher energy resolution and being able to probe different symmetries would seem to play into the, the kinds of arguments that, uh, uh, that you're interested in making here. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I'll look further into it. Yeah, the beam damage though, um, it'd be, uh, it'll be interesting. Um, um, uh, again, people should be typing in questions, please. Um, uh, I, I, going back a little bit, I had a question way back on slide 18 and, and maybe that leads into what I just asked anyway. So that was the Zanes, right? That was the Zanes, for example, on the left. And, and I think you made a statement that the, the sharpness of the um, resulting double peak feature would correlate with the degree of order. And that wasn't entirely obvious to me, given that each of these states is made up of, of some distribution of states whose, you know, it's gonna depend on Coulomb overlaps and all kinds of stuff. And so I was wondering if you could motivate um, uh, why it is that you think the sharpness is related specifically to disorder and not to something else. Yeah, yeah. So, so for the L3 edge, we're doing a 2P to 6S and 6D transition. Uh, so, so this, the D states are probably hybridized a bit with the, the P states and, and so on. So I, I don't, it's a little, yeah. So I guess what I, the statement I made is I probably pushed a little bit too much uh, in terms of extracting just structural information. Uh, there's, you know, there's, there's the effects of, uh, chemical bonding and, and et cetera as well. Uh, I should probably just reword and say, I, I speculate that if we consider just, a, if we think about it just to, in terms of the, the crystal field splitting of the 6D states, and then maybe we can say that the sharpness of features is related to the internal distortion or not, or, or, or the degree of internal distortion, the lead bromine octahedral. I think, I, I think that's very reasonable. I had actually wondered if you already had calculations that told you you didn't have to worry about a change in the, uh, in the shape of the contributions and consequently you could make inferences about structure. Yeah, actually here I, I should have added a citation. It's, it's my mistake, but, but there was work by uh, Drisdale and all uh, from 2017, I think, where they actually, uh, Prendergast, et cetera, where they actually calculated um, for the lead alpha edge. So, so that's something I've, I've used and have cited in the manuscript, but I, I see, I see. yeah. Okay, Selena, you have a question or two? Yes, I have two. One is certainly quite quick. I was wondering if you prepare these single crystals and you cleave them, do you ever have problems with charging or is this very straightforward? Yeah, yeah. So at PM4, which is the low flux beamline, I, I don't have any problems with charging. Uh, but at max four block with uh, high, you know, the, it's an ARPIS beamline, very small spot and a lot of photons. Uh, that definitely has been a problem. Um, in fact, it's been a problem such that um, the organic perovskites just, just don't stand a chance and there's not a whole lot we can do about it because we, we can't defocus the beam. Uh, with cesium lead bromide, we were able to get some some measurements, but then it was charging, and so we had to do we had to compensate with uh, you know increasing the buffer conductivity and doing some other things. I see. And then, if I may, a second question regarding um, 
the DFT calculation where you try to associate the projected density of states. So if you are looking at the methyl ammonium states there, do you think DFT can really get them very well? Because so my theoreticians told me since they are not as delocalized, it really depends on the functional where they are positioned. So, so okay, my question is, are, are you sure they are positioned this way or are you flexible in thinking they might be somewhere else? Are you talking about the position of the methyl ammonium in the real space? No. Uh, okay. no, here in the project, so this is the right image, right? You have these at 10 EV and 12 EV, these states that you say they yeah. belong to methyl ammonium, yeah. but they might be at 11 and at 13. I, I think DFT cannot mm, yeah, I see. calculate I see. Um, these partially localized states that well. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on the choice of functional and the choice of basis set. So I think our, um, our collaborators use the 6311 um, Gaussian basis set, uh, which yeah, here I'm, I can't comment too much, but I, I think uh, they, they, they said that it should be able to capture the semi-localized character of these states. Okay, that's good. 